this video, we're going to look at more examples of double integrals over general regions, where we may have to use some different properties or techniques to make the evaluation possible, or at least make it easier. So here's an important property that we may have to use. If your region of integration can be divided into two parts. So if D is the union D1 and D2, then we can evaluate the double integral of F over the region D as the sum of the double integral of F over the region D1 plus double integral of F over the region D2. How can this help us? Well, let's look at this example. Our integrand is x squared y, and the region d is enclosed by two parabolas, a y squared parabola, x equals 1 half y squared minus 1, and an x squared parabola, y equals 1 half x squared minus x minus 1. Let's look at the graphs. So this region D kind of looks like a teardrop. And the issue we have with this region D is that it's neither type one nor type two. Why is that? Because our upper curve changes. So for a while, actually it's the lower curve that changes. So for a while, the lower curve is the x squared parabola until we hit the y-axis. And then the lower curve becomes the y squared parabola. And on, then we have the same problem if we try to look at it as type 2. The uh, right curve is fine. It's the left curve that changes. The left curve is the y squared parabola until we get to, again, the y-axis. And then between x equals 0 and x equals 1, the left curve is the x squared parabola. So in both cases, we don't have a single left and right pair or a single upper and lower pair. So what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is divide that region into multiple parts. And there's many different ways you could do this. I think this way uh, yields the simplest double integrals, but there may be other ways which are also pretty simple. And so now we've got two parts, D1 and D2. So D1 is the portion of our region which is to the left of the y-axis. D2 is the portion to the right of the y-axis. Now D1, we can view that as being x bounded between the y-axis and the y-squared parabola. So in other words, I would have a left curve, which is the x equals uh, 1 half y squared minus 1 half. And the right curve is the line uh, x equals 0. That's the y-axis. And that region goes from y equals negative 1 up to y equals 1. So that would be a type 2 region. So we should be able to evaluate that double integral. The second region, we can see that as having an upper or top curve. Now, that is the y squared parabola, but we can solve that for y. I'll get y equals radical 2x plus 1. And I only use the positive radical because it is the upper branch of that parabola. Then the bottom curve or lower curve is just the x squared parabola. So y is bounded between, on the top, 
radical 2x plus 1, and on the bottom by 1 half x squared minus x minus 1. And x ranges from 0 to 4 in that region D2, which is a type 2 region. So I should be able to evaluate both of those double integrals. So let's start with the double integral over d1. So I'm going to be, d1 is type 2, so I'm going to have to have dx as my inner integral. The bounds for that inner integral, the upper bound is the right curve, so x equals 0. The lower bound is the left curve, negative 1 half y squared minus 1 half. Let's anti-differentiate with respect to x. And then let's do the substitution. Putting in x equals 0 doesn't yield anything. When I do the subtraction, I could factor out a negative 1 half x. I mean, sorry, negative 1 half. I'd be left with uh, y squared plus 1 inside. Uh, when I cube it, I would get a negative 1 half, but since I'm subtracting it, that becomes positive. All right, so uh, if I break that up as 1 eighth times y squared plus 1 cubed, I'll bring the 1 eighth out in front and multiply it times the 1 third to get 1 over 24. And now what's left over can be evaluated using a u substitution. So I'll use u equals y squared plus 1. du is 2y dy. Um, and then, uh, of course, y dy would be half of du. Let's try to change the bounds to u value. So when y equals negative 1, u equals 2. When I, y equals 1, u also equals 2. Wait a minute. If I have the same bounds, what would that mean for the value of the integral? Well, of course, if I look at the integrand, the integrand is a, an odd function. And my bounds of integration are opposite. And so if the integrand is odd and the bounds are opposite, then it's going to evaluate to 0 which is exactly what I would have got if I finished my u substitution and had the upper bound equal to the lower bound, it would also have to evaluate to zero. So I didn't quite see that at the beginning, but it's always good to check whenever you have uh, bounds which are opposite to see if you can take advantage of that. So let's look at the double integral over region D2. Now, this is a type 1 integral, and so I'm going to have to integrate with respect to y first. That will be my inner integral, dy. The lower bound of integration is 1 half x squared minus x minus 1. The upper bound is radical 2x plus 1. So let's go ahead and anti-differentiate with respect to y. And go ahead and do the substitution. Now, when I put in radical 2x plus 1 in the place of y squared, in the place of y, uh, then I just get 2x plus 1. And then I'm going to put this trinomial in the place of y. So uh, I'll have to square that out. And then the 1 half x squared, I put the 1 half out in front. After I do all of the algebra inside the brackets, I'll still have to multiply things by x squared. Now this looks like it's going to give me a lot of terms. But when you do the algebra, first of all, when you square this trinomial, uh, you're going to get uh, only 1, 2, 3, four terms instead of six terms. Um, how many would you get? Three times three. No. You would get five terms. So the x squared term is not there. 
uh, it turns out that it just happens to add to make zero. The coefficients add to make zero. But then I also have a 2x plus 1 and then a minus 2x minus 1. So those are going to add to make 0. So I'll only be left with two terms, which I'll need to multiply by x squared. So I have the negative 1 fourth x to the 6th plus x to the 5th. I still have the multiplier of 1 half outside the integral. So take the antiderivative and do some arithmetic and you get the fraction 1024 over 21. And so the other integral was 0. So now we can say that uh, the double integral over the entire region d of x squared y dA equals 10, 24 over 21. And like I said, you can divide this up uh, in other ways, which will give you type 1 and type 2 regions. And I went ahead and did that, uh, trying to uh, split it down here at the line y equals negative 1. Uh, it was definitely more complicated, but arrived at the same answer. So now, um, the, fun, the next technique is kind of a, a, a different story because it involves uh, regions where which could be considered as both type 1 and type 2. Now, Sometimes you may have an integrand where it is very difficult or maybe even impossible to find an antiderivative. So what we could try in that case would be to interchange the order of integration to see if we get a simpler inner integral. Now, to be able to do that, you really need to sketch the region of integration. So here's an example. And in this example, all we're going to do is practice sketching the region and interchanging the order of integration. We're not going to do any evaluation because we don't know anything about the integrand. We're just told that it's some function f. So the bounds on the inner integral, which is a dy integral, are 0 and natural log of x. So that means that my upper curve is y equals the natural log of x. The lower curve is y equals 0. And it's that portion between those two curves that goes between x equals 1 and x equals 2. That's our region, so let's try to sketch that. Now, sketching y equals 0 is not a challenge. That's just the x-axis. Uh, the challenge, then, is going to be how do we sketch y equals natural log of x? So we could use technology, but really at this point, if you're in calculus three, you should be able to make a rough sketch of y equals the natural log of x. So we can just plot some points. I know that for any log function, that the log of one is zero. So every graph passes through the point 1 comma 0. And then I know that e is approximately 2.7. And the natural log of e is going to be 1. Uh, 1 over e, all right, uh, full disclosure, I had to use my calculator to find 1 over e. Uh, but it's around 0.3. And the natural log of 1 over e E, that would be e to the negative 1 power. So that's just going to be negative 1. So I've got these three points. I can go ahead and connect them with a smooth curve as best I can. 
And that's going to be y equals natural log of x. And I can go ahead and put in my other bounds. Well, y equals 0 is just the x-axis. It's already there. Uh, at x equals 1, uh, the two curves meet. So there's nothing to do there. But I'll go ahead and draw a line there at x equals 2. So this is my shaded region right here. That is my region D. And so I'd like to view this now as a type 2 curve. So I need to think about, well, what would be my right curve? The right curve is the line x equals 2. And I'm going to rewrite y equals natural log of x as x equals e to the power of y. That is my left curve. Right curve is the line. Left curve now is x equals e to the power of y. And what about my y values? Well, they go from 0 up to this point, which would be y equals natural log of 2. So here's my region in set notation. I would say that x goes from e to the power of y on the left to x equals 2 on the right. And my y values go from 0 to natural log of 2. And so you know, that would tell me that uh, my dx has to be the inner integral with these bounds. And dy is the outer integral with those bounds. So my inner integral is dx going from e to the power of y to 2. The outer integral is dy going from 0 to natural log of 2. So let's look at an example where interchanging the order of integration simplifies the integration. Here I have the integral of, uh, well, the double integral, where the inner integral has bounds x squared and 1. The outer integral is 0 to 1. The integrand is radical y sine of y. We're integrating with respect to y first. Now, finding the antiderivative of radical y sine y, I'm pretty sure that's possible. I think you need to make first a u substitution, maybe u equals radical y. Uh, and then after you do the u substitution, I think you're going to wind up doing integration by parts uh, two or three times. So that's a lot of work. And so it makes me wonder, hmm, I wonder if we could do uh, better by interchanging the order of integration. So let's write out the uh, domain of integration in set notation. So I'm saying that y is bounded above by y equals 1, bounded below by the parabola y equals x squared, and our region only spans for x equals 0 to x equals 1. So let's sketch those two curves, y equals 1, y equals x squared, y equals 1 to be the top curve, y equals x squared to be the bottom curve, and we're going from x equals 0 to x equals 1. So it's this region above the parabola, below the line, y equals 1. Now, if I interchange the order of integration, so instead of having a top and a bottom curve, I want to have a right and a left curve. So the right curve means I'd have to solve this equation for x. So on the right side, I'd get x equals radical y. On the left side, I would get x equals negative radical y. And of course, the y-axis is x equals 0. So now my right curve is x equals radical y. My left curve is x equals 0. And that ranges from y equaling 0 up to y equals 1. So in set notation, I could write it this way. And so this tells me that since I have my formulas associated with the x variable, that the dx is going to be the inner in inter integral. Since I have numbers on my bounds for y, then it's going to be 
the outer integral. And so let's go ahead. Now, radical y sine y, I'm just going to treat that as a constant when I anti-differentiate with respect to x. And then when I perform the evaluation, my integrand becomes y sine of y. Now, this does make a big difference. I still have to do integration by parts, but only once. It's a fairly simple integration by parts, too. So I'll set u equal to y. du will be dy. dv is sine of y dy. Taking the antiderivative of sine gives me negative cosine of y. So remember, integration by parts. It's going to be uv minus integral v du. So u times v would be negative y cosine of y. I still have to do the evaluation from 0 to 1. And then the, uh, my integral is going to be 0 to y cosine of y. Well, it's negative cosine of y, but we have a minus sign. So that makes this a plus. So I'll go ahead and do the evaluation. Find the antiderivative of cosine, which is just sine. Perform that evaluation, and I get sine of 1 minus cosine of 1. That's my exact answer. No need to pull out my calculator. If I did use my calculator, remember the 1 means 1 radian. Whenever we're working with sine and cosine as functions, not as ratios of uh, in a triangle, we have to use radian. So in our last example, we're going to try to take advantage of symmetry. Remember that with uh, integrals of a single variable, we could take advantage of symmetry if we had uh, bounds which were opposites of each other. And we saw that in the previous example. If you had an odd function, the integral would be 0. And if it was an even function, the integral wouldn't be 0, but we could just double the value and switch the bounds from 0 to just the upper bound. Well, what can we do in this case? Well, if I graph the integrand over the given region R, it certainly looks like that the portion of the volume which is above the xy plane looks to be exactly the same as the portion below. So just looking at it, I would think that this is going to turn out to be 0. But we can't just trust looks. Let's see if we can do some analysis to show that, indeed, this should evaluate to being zero without having to compute an antiderivative. So looking at the region, I do have bounds on x, which are opposites. So let's go ahead and do the dx integral on the inside. Uh, since this is a rectangle, it wouldn't really matter whether I put dx or dy. But since the bounds which are opposite are the ones that are interesting to me, Let's look at those first. All right, if I'm going to anti-differentiate with respect to x, then y I'm going to, is going to be considered as a constant. So I could consider or think about this function as being a function of x only. g of x equals xy over 1 plus x to the fourth. So that's why we're keeping y as constant. But doing some analysis here, if I replace x with negative x, well, I'll get negative xy in the numerator. I'll get 1 plus, in parentheses, negative x to the fourth. But that's an odd, I mean, sorry, that's an even exponent. And so if I take negative x and raise it to the power of 4, I just get x to the power of 4. So the numerator doesn't change when I replace x with negative x. The denominator changes sign. So the whole function has changed sign. And that's our definition of an odd function. So we have an odd function. Now we may also just skip this whole notion of keeping y constant and just make the note that, 
oh, f of x comma y, my function here is odd in x. It's odd in x. And just as an aside, just think to yourself, what about in y? Is it an odd function in y as well? Is it an even function in y or neither? Think about that for a minute. Well, back to our problem. We have bounds which are opposite. So on the inner integral, we're going from negative 1 to 1. Our integrand is odd, so that's going to evaluate to 0. So the answer to my little question is the integrand even, odd, or neither in y. It's also odd in y. So, but I don't have uh, bounds which are opposite. So uh, that wouldn't really help me in this particular problem. So we're left with just looking at double integrals in polar coordinates, which will be our next video.